Bless us all. God bless us all. Oh, yes! Ladies and gentlemen, welcome in to Snow the Goalie. Most recently, very recently, the number five hockey podcast on Apple Podcasts, hockey podcast list, the only Flyers podcast. What do you do after you hit number five? You in take America. a week and a hack off. Yeah, in America, in the, in in the U.S. Yeah, it's the United there. States. In America, yeah. uh, Canada's part of America, Anthony. Don't don't be a you know an elitist here. The United States. Anyway, what do you do? You take a week and a half off. That's what you do because we are a loving, inclusive podcast, and we decided that it's better to let our ranking fall and let some of our friends in the podcast community get their shot to try to elevate. And we'll see if it happens or not. But you're welcome if you're listening out there and you have a, a Flyers podcast. Anyway, I'm Russ Joy at Joy on Broad, joined by Anthony Sanfilippo on Twitter, at Anson Philly, and Chris Terrian, good old Bundy, on Twitter, at C Terrian 6 Guys, lots to break down, lots to talk about. Philadelphia Flyers, a lot of stuff going on. Kimo Timonen had some interesting remarks. Claude Giroux is gone. People are still crying on Twitter, and I hate everything. Let's get into it with a little bit of positivity today. Let's go to the captain of positivity, a man who wrote up a post uh, talking to a scout about uh, a talent evaluator about some of the college guys that the Flyers are bringing into the fold. Mr. Positivity himself, Anthony Sanfilippo. Hey, fella. Hey, how you doing, guys? Um, yeah, I mean, I did I did talk to Dave Starman. I don't know, Bunny, do you know Dave Starman? Heard the name, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he was a scout for a long time for both Toronto and Montreal. Yes. A uh, little bit of time with Seattle. I think, like, really, like, like the one season before, the, before this year, I uh, kind of helped him out. He's done some, like, coaching at the uh, USA hockey level and stuff. So he knows a lot of the players. I mean, now he's a, uh, an analyst for CBS – um, sports with their uh, NCAA hockey coverage, right? Yeah. So, so I wanted to get his kind of take. You know, obviously he sees all these guys play um, in college hockey. Plus, he was a scout, and so he, he knows what teams are looking for. He knows what to look at in a player's game to see what makes them. You know, are, are they ready to take that next step to go to the next level? Um, and I did. Yeah, I, I asked him about a couple of these kids that the Flyers are. are you know, they already signed. Uh, Noah Cates uh, was a fifth round pick in. Um, 2017 I was a, a Hextall pick um Ronnie Adderd the defenseman right-handed defenseman who was a third round pick one of Chuck's picks 2019 uh and coming coming soon uh right after the Frozen Four Bobby Brink uh who was announced today as a matter of fact as a one of the three finalists for the Hobie Baker uh Hobie Baker war for MVP of hockey in uh in the NCAA and and um uh, he will he will sign with the Flyers as soon as as soon as University of Denver is eliminated, whether it's in the Final Four or after the championship game. So I asked him about these three guys, and I'll tell you what, he gave a glowing review of all three. Said pretty much said all three are NHL players. Basically called Noah Cates, you know, bottom six forward, but certainly one that fits into a good bottom six role. Thinks Ronnie Adder can be a uh, a second pair defenseman. Um, uh, and he's a right shot guy, uh, which is, which is, you know, obviously that's something they're always, you know, all these teams are chasing. And he thinks Bobby Brink is going to be a legit scorer at this level, but thinks he needs a little bit of time in the AHL before he really, I mean, he's going to play some games for the Flyers here. He said, but it, it would do him good to play 80 to hundred games in the AHL before he really comes to the NHL on a full-time basis. So, but anyway, uh, that said, Look, if you're looking for some positives for down the road, I, I sought an independent opinion, somebody who's not tied to the organization who watches these guys play. And, he, you know, he likes what he sees in, in, the, in some of these Flyers prospects. So that's probably a good thing. Bundy, how are you feeling? How are you feeling yeah. about the state of the Flyers right now? Not about these prospects, but how are you feeling? Yeah, I don't do the prospect thing that much. I told Andy. I think I just spent too much time broadcasting NHL games over the years, and I just lost – lost touch completely with the kids, but that's a good sign. You know, I am always hesitant, Anthony, just to, to touch upon what Anthony was saying. I get, I always get worried with the college kids in a sense, especially the ones you're unaware of. Like the kid that went to Harvard, remember went to the Rangers. He was supposed to be like the greatest player that the league would ever see. Yeah. Uh, and he came in, what was, I can't remember his name. He won yeah, the Hobie. Um, yeah. I'm trying to remember what his name was. Uh, that's how forgotten he is. And he yeah. was a hit name seven years ago, right? When he came out of college, his career was over like two years ago. Right. Um, Smart kid. I mean, he went to Harvard, so he's going to be able to, you know, do whatever he did beyond making NHL money. But again, you know, you don't know. I don't. I, you don't know until you see these kids for a bulk of games either. It's just different, you know. So my hopes are always high that the kids are going to be good, and that's what we hope for. Yeah, um, I do love hearing that. And there are there are fines. Like you have kids develop well in college. Uh, you know, it's different. It's an older game. 
it's an older than that the transition you see from the Ontario League or the the, the, the junior A leagues in Canada. So I'd be more apt as a, as a scout or somebody trying to find kids to find that diamond in a rough to find it, seek it through the, the college level uh, yeah. from that sense of things. Well one, so, one of the, well, one of the things that Dave said when we were talking, and I didn't put this in the story, but he said, you know, one of the things about college kids is that they're more ready for the AHL than kids coming out of junior. Oh, he yeah. Says they, he says they're, they've been playing. They're more mature. They're more physical. And they're ready for it. He said they may not be as talented. And he says, so what you're going to find is usually these college kids that either go undrafted or who are drafted later, you know, they end up being role players. They don't end up becoming stars. He says, but they're more ready for that. They're ready to come in and say, oh, I need to be a role player. Okay. And adapt to it. Then a, then a junior kid who comes in, who was scoring 75, 80 points and thinks he's a superstar and now comes to the AHL and is being asked to, you know, kill penalties and play third line. They're like, what do you yeah. mean? <laughs> yeah. You know what it's like, Anthony? I'll, I'll be honest with you. The best way to, to, to give an example to people listening that can't correspond it or correlate to hockey. It's like St. Peter's beating Kentucky. Yeah. In a sense, you can have a dynamic Ontario hockey league team with tops, like maybe three first round picks on that team that are loaded, but then you play a college team, let's say like a Minnesota state, right. Or something like that. Yeah. And they'll just like, I mean, you might get a young Boston college team that plays an older team that you don't know the name of them in the Midwest of the country in, ho in hockey and they smoke them yeah. because they're just yeah. older. They've been waiting. There's really no NHL waiting yet. Those three kids on those low on the Kentucky kid, the kid, kids that we're talking about, they're going to go play in the NBA and be stars and household names where the kids at St. Peter's were 23 and 24 years old. Some of them, and they just weren't that impressed by some 18 year old star. that right. was going, and they got up and down the court. It's the same type of thing here. Yes. You're hoping that the, the upside for those young kids in the Ontario League or those kids that are drafted the top five, you know, become great players for you. But the college kids you're getting, you're right. They're maybe your bottom six or a, or a last pair. Or sometimes you find a guy who could jump right in uh, and he truly wanted to be in college for two years. Um, so that's, that's I think, the best correlation I could give is that type of St. Peter's being – why did they why did they beat those three schools that were loaded with talent? Because they were older and they realized that they're – you know, their fortunes weren't going to be what those kids were, but their basketball skills are pretty high enough that they could still compete and actually win a game at a neutral site uh, facility. Yeah. And the one other thing that he said, which is kind of interesting too, and yet, you know, you, we, we kind of forget this, Bundy, but, you know, go back to when you were drafted. Um, that was, there was more than seven rounds, right? There was 12 rounds when you were, when you were drafted. There, there or, was, yeah, there was 12 yeah. rounds. Yeah. Yeah. And so now he says, you know, now there's only seven. He says, so a lot of these kids, would if we were still drafting 12 rounds would be draft picks of teams that just they get would. get te the teams pass up on them just because they are they're limited on their number of picks right and says well yep. they're they're in college they're gonna go play college we can we can always sign them as free agents down the road so that's why a lot of times these kids end up becoming you, you know free agent signees you know at this time of year and, and so because of, you know because the draft has shrunk that kind of explains a lot of a lot of why a lot of these guys don't get drafted right away it's an interesting route to go if you're a, a GM, too. It makes a lot of sense, especially for what this team is or should be. If you can fill out some of these bottom six roles and you can potentially have a guy like Adder that can maybe eventually grow into a second pair role, it, it's nice to have guys that are, are cost efficient, right? Especially if you're going to try to swing for the fences with you know a, a potential big money signing at some point, whether it's this off season or next off season, or to have the flexibility to be able to to you know maneuver around this cap over the next few years, it's a good way to go. It, it's especially good if it works out. If it doesn't, you're really not on the hook for that much. It's not like you go out and you sign a, a fringe bottom six guy to a two or three year contract where that money's going to count against you no matter what. So I actually don't have a problem going to college. Right? I think it's fine. I think it's interesting that Adderd is a right-handed defenseman who could potentially become a second-pair defenseman. Um, great that he's now blocked for the next five years, but I digress. See, I just want to throw that in for good old Ant. All I'm saying, too, though, guys, just be careful. Like, when you hear something like that, and I appreciate Ant, that you, you, you got Dave telling you that. My point is, though, sometimes get a flair to see them when they come in before you judge them. The one thing we're, yeah. we're notorious for in Philadelphia is prejudging talent. And, and putting a sticker on them before they've really shown who they are. So I, I you know, I urge the fans, give these kids a chance because, you know, you might have Ronnie Adder coming in with, you know, cross, you know, stole the goalie, say, oh, he's a second pair guy. He may not be that second pair guy. Right. Maybe right. a lower guy, maybe a seventh or an eighth, or he may be a top pair. So I just, I, I just urge people to sure. be vigilant, give these kids a chance to see them. There's no hurry right now. 
So allow them the chance to develop a little bit without giving them the, uh, you know, Bronx cheer from the second deck, if there's even anybody in the second deck anymore. But um, that's, you know, that's what I'm saying. Just, just be vigilant with, the, you know, how you watch kids come along because everybody's going to grow differently when they get to the NHL and it may not be what you thought it was going to be. And again, it's obviously why teams have multiple scouts, right? That's why you have so many scouts and you try to come to a consensus because what a guy, you know, evaluates about a young player uh, will vary from from guy to guy. Now, on the occasion that there is somebody who's a stud prospect and everybody agrees, then you feel good about it. Or, you know, you have a GM who just overrules them anyway and takes Nolan Patrick. Anyway, let's get into uh, uh, the I, post. I just, what? I just oh, want to say one okay. thing, to, just one last thing to kind of sure. kind of sort of support what uh, Bundy was saying um, about be careful with these, uh, you know, the Hobie Baker thing. Did you know that only one Hobie Baker winner has ever reached the uh, Hockey Hall of Fame? Wow. Only one. And that'll be well, Paul. I'm going to see if I can even guess it. Well, I already said it. Paul Correa. Paul Correa. Wow. Paul Correa. I mean, there's been some names. I mean, I'm looking at the list of winners over the years. I mean, there's been some guys who've been pretty good players. I mean, even guys that are still good players in the league today. I mean, you know, uh, Johnny Gaudreau, he, I mean, he won it, right? I mean, he's got 90 points this year. McCarr, he won it. You know, and you look at Cole Caulfield, the kind of start he's gotten off to. Jack Eichel. I mean, there's some players that are in the league today that have won it. I mean, one of your uh, – did you play with Matt Carl? Bundy, he he was. Uh, no, but I, you know, I covered him when I was doing radio. He won it too. Yeah, he was a Hobie. Uh, he was a Hobie winner. That was the weirdest one. I was here for like two years. I don't think I even realized he won the Hobie. I didn't even, you know, you looked at. It's yeah. not like you, used to be. you feel like it was this really decorated award at one time, or these legendary figures. And then you come along, and it's, you know, sometimes you don't even know who the guys are anymore. Uh, yeah. Who? I mean, we couldn't even remember the guy's name that went to New York. We'll get that by the end of the show. I you talking about it Jim, is Jimmy, like, Jimmy Vesey? Jimmy Vesey, Jimmy Vesey. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and, and yeah. again, you know, he actually started off well. He go to the front of the net, then I think he stopped going to the front of the net, stopped scoring goals, and next thing you know, he's using his Harvard degree for something instead of getting pucks into the back of the net. <laughs> it is interesting, though. Like, Ant, the names that you just rattled off, that's what, five or six of the last – is that like in the last 10 years, 12 years? Yeah. Some good uh, names there. Right? Like, well, that's – if you, that, if you're that, since that's Goudreau, a nice trend. If you're going since Gaudreau, you had Gaudreau in 14, Eichel 15 – uh, McCarr 19 and Caulfield 21. So four, four of the last seven. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a nice trend. Like if you're looking for positive, if, if you're somebody out there who's listening, who's superstitious, right. And you're like, no, now we got to, we got to root against Bobby Brink. We can't let him win this award. Cause we're all going to, you know, he's yeah. going to become nothing in the press. It is nice. That that's one nice, one nice well, thing. But, yeah. But the good thing is, is they were all, they were all previously drafted prior to winning mm. so they were already on and they, they were already drafted by an nhl team before they won it there have been guys who've won it who were undrafted and as a matter of fact the other two finalists with bobby brink are ufa are undrafted kids so it's kind of you know it's kind of interesting like i said well if brink wins it well okay then maybe he fits follows that line of uh that pattern that we're that we're seeing with you know good players but if one of the other guys wins it maybe he's more of a of jimmy jimmy Vesey, Vesey type uh, or, you know, Will Butcher or Drew LeBlanc. Yes, these are names from the re- recent seasons. That- yeah, Will Butcher won the Heisman, didn't he? <laughs> right? Yeah, Will Butcher, yes. The yeah, I mean, there you go. He can't play in his own zone, but he's got yeah. wonderful skills. Um, I don't know how many games right. he gets one, but yeah, all right, anyway. It's good yeah. stuff. This we'll is go- so much more. I think we just talked more about the college game in this one episode than we have in the first three years of the show combined. So look at us. That's good. This is hashtag growth. This is a growth mindset. Well done. Progressive. Gentlemen. We're progressive. Yeah, we sure are. So let's progress into a new era like the Philadelphia Flyers have. Now, sure, they've only won two of the games since Claude Giroux has been moved. But the team is arguably a better watch right now. And there's a whole hell of a lot of effort. It looks as if a team that had been kind of carrying around with them this weight on their back, this dark cloud hovering over their head. You know, we don't talk about Giroux. No, no, no. We don't talk about Giroux. A little Encanto reference there. See that? You guys. You don't have little kids. <laughs> anyway, uh, they they don't have this cloud yeah, looming overhead we, anymore. We, and We don't talk about Bruno. I know. That was the – that was we don't talk about Giroux. That was the play, Anthony. All right, just go oh. to sleep. So here's the positive, right? It we, We're getting two good things here that I think we should be able to feel good about, and I, I want to get your opinions on this. One, the team looks like they're playing, um, I, I don't know if we'd say with more gusto, but you have a lot of guys that are trying to compete for potential jobs for next year, which is nice. Guys who know that this, is, this might be their only shot or one of their only shots to get themselves on game film for other teams in the league to evaluate their their potential in the league and 
you're losing games, which is good. You're trying, but you don't have a good enough talent base to actually win these games. So from a draft pick perspective, this is good. You're not fostering a losing culture because the guys are going out playing hard, but you're still getting those losses. And I think that's a great thing. Bundy, how do you feel about it? Do you think that this is what we should hope for? This is this is the, the whole thing. Well, they're playing like a team that belongs to Philadelphia in a sense. Like they're 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 giving an effort. They're working working really hard night after night. And again, and I and I think you hit it right there, Russ and Anthony won't disagree. You had younger kids coming in and playing their first games and in front of their families in Minnesota and and getting the opportunities. It doesn't matter necessarily, you know, what your skill level's like because you're you're going to lose most nights, but you're going to at least it's going to show passion. You're going to show guys trying to hit, trying to impress the brass and Chuck Fletcher and, and uh, the press box, you know, say, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm here next year. So that's what the fans are seeing right now. And it, and it comes down to effort. Anytime you have, you know, uh, a redefined effort or uh, a, a different looking goal than the one you had in a team. Listen, uh, you know, when you talk about Giroux, part of Giroux for me, and I, this is why I said, guys, I should have made changes a while ago. I don't look like someone saying, uh, you know, like, pulling something down, but I did. I said, you should have been gone five years ago. The problem is when you rely on somebody so much and you rely on that type of formula to shine through, other players sometimes, whether they believe it or not, will sit back and almost watch that production in, in live action. And I think some nights it happened with the Flyers power play under Giroux, late in games, down a goal. And listen, I'm going to give them credit. They came back in an awful lot of games over the years, late games they shouldn't have even been in. And a lot of that was because of the magic that Giroux created uh, and, and, and when they were down a man, whether it's a six on five situation or power place, I just think five on five, they're going to be a different looking team. It's very hard to replace that kind of talent on the power play of a guy like Giroux. But I think in terms of what they're doing moving forward, you're seeing guys now taking a bite of the apple that they hadn't taken quite the bite of before, or maybe didn't have think in their head that they were, they, they had enough growth with the team. Connecties looked a little bit different. You know, even Provorov, he didn't have a great game in Minnesota, but he's played a little bit better, better, much better in the games prior to that. Some of the forwards are doing things that are harder, right, Anthony? The things that they weren't doing before, getting in the corner, putting that hard, honest battle in to try to win a 50-50 puck. We were, I didn't see a lot of that. I, I saw a lazy, um, I don't, I hate using that word lazy. I saw a, lot, a team many nights that I don't think had their work boots on to the fullest. And I think, listen, when you're when you have a record that the Flyers have right now, there's a lot of things that have gone wrong during the course of the year. But I feel like somehow the coding of Claude Giroux on this team is being peeled off. And whether you like that or you hate that, it's a necessary thing that has to happen for everybody to move forward, especially the players in this case. There's a different directive that they're going to place on themselves because they know that they're part of now the solution. If they're still here, they're still there. They got to buy in. If they want this team to be better, they want to move them forward. And if they're not, then over time, they'll get moved out of here. That, so that's what the way the world works. But as of right now, they're probably a lot of guys that have been here for three, four, five years that find themselves, I'm sure, mentally and physically in a different part of the hockey game because of Giroux's departure. And it's an opportunity for them to show who they are as those individuals, but also as team guys, uh, for what the Flyers are looking to do moving into the, you know, moving into next season. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're not wrong with any, anything that you just said. I mean, you, you really aren't. I mean, they, these guys have looked better. I mean, you, you mentioned Provorov. I think Provorov's actually probably been, this is probably his best 10-game stretch yeah. of the season. Yeah, I mean, you know, the Minnesota game aside, but I mean, the, the stretch of the year, if you're looking at a course of 10, in groups of 10 games, definitely been his best. Now, that said, it's been since he's been partnered with Cam York. Now, I don't necessarily know if Cam York is a guy that you play with Provorov next year, but at least right now, that's a, that's a pair that's working, right? And so it's, it tells you a little bit of something about, you know, Provorov, maybe, okay, he, he can, maybe he can rebound, but it also tells you a little bit about York that he's probably, you know, you know here to stay, and, and there's no, really no reason to not be playing uh, big minutes at, this, at, the, at the NHL level and getting him acclimated at this point. Um, and then, you know, guys like Faraby, who's, who's well, kind of, you know, they move Faraby to center. And well, I'm just, I'm just going to just keep going yeah. on with what Bundy's saying. You know, they move Faraby to center and, you know, trying him out there, seeing if that's a position that he could play. They think it's a, they think it's a role that he could play and play well. Um, you know, give it a shot here for 15 games and see if that works out. You mentioned Konechny looks like a different player. And you're right. This is a thing. And Faraby said it and Mike Yo said it um, after the Islander game a little over a week ago. Um, which was the first home game after the Drew trade. And they, and they both said, um, it's a new era. 
you don't say it's a new era if it's, you know, oh, well, you know, Claude Giroux is going to come back next year. Everything will be fine. No, no. It's a new era. We have moved into a new time where it's going to be somebody else's turn to be to take that mantle from Giroux. And it might not be one guy. It might be two, three guys that have to do it. And that's fine. But that's that's where they're at. So even though they're two and five and there have been a couple games where they have not played great. I mean, in this stretch, I mean, the Minnesota game was pretty ugly. The, the Colorado game, the Detroit game, those three games were not good games. But even the, even a couple games that they, you know, they did lose in Nashville. I thought they played played hard in that game. They beat St. Louis and St. Louis. That's a good win for them. Right. Um, beating the Islanders. So I think that they've had a few good games, a few clunkers. But on the whole, yes, they are playing more as a team with a different focus. And you know what else, Anthony, just to just to add to that, Russ, sorry, but you know what? That player, you talk about Giroux, that player may not be here yet either. Right. You know, that may right. not, we just may not know who that guy is, you know, who's going to fill a void. You know, I, I just want to, I just want to answer this because it's probably the question I get the most on direct messages, but in, in a varying sense, and I'll answer it right now, because you're just following up what you said, Anthony, people ask me, Bundy, what do you think the odds are that Giroux comes back next year? I'm going to give you the percent right now, and I'm not going to waver on it. Two percent. That's it. That's what I say. And that might be two percent too high. I don't think he's coming back, but I really don't think that there's a forward leaning plan that the Flyers have where Giroux is is back on this team in the fall. Yeah, I don't see it either. I I, I think he I think it depends on what happens with Florida, in all honesty, where he is next year. But I I think he ends up going back to Ottawa. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that, too. Yeah. Yeah. He's from there. His wife's from there. Wrap up his career, team. And, you know. Yeah, I know, right? I mean, who knows? Like, we we'll moving to Quebec City for you know that whole story that was kind of broke. It's kind of crazy, but anyway, yes. So, I, yeah, I don't think he's going to be here either. Russ, what were you going to what were you going to say there? Sorry, Russ. I, well, no, I mean, there, there's two things. One, I mean, if if he goes to Ottawa, I mean, that's the ultimate loser mentality, and it, it is what it is. You're not going to Ottawa to win a Stanley Cup. Then you hope you sure hope that you're uh, you're going to win well, in where, Florida, right? Well, that's why I said it depends on what happens with Florida. Wait a minute. Yeah. Did you just but, say that Ottawa may not win? Because I have a couple of friends I, up there where I was born and raised, and they actually think the Senators are very, very close to capturing a Stanley Cup and having a parade down Elgin Street. Oh, oh yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If, if all the other teams <laughs> fold, sure. Why not? Anything <laughs> could happen, right? <laughs> Somebody's plane gets delayed, and you're out playing against yeah, you know right. the Zamboni <laughs> driver. Yeah. I sure, think the Senators I think, have a shot. I think they're a team that's, that's coming, though. I mean, I do think that they're going to be good within about three years, two to three yeah. years. Yeah. Yeah, but not but not within the Claude Giroux remaining career arc, right? So like, if he goes there again, I will say, loser mentality, loser energy, that would be incredibly dumb. If he win, if he wins the Stanley Cup with Florida, if he this wins year. the Cup with Florida, fine. But no, I I will counter though. Like if if he wins the Cup with Florida and they come back to him with a decent offer in the off season, right? Like if they make a couple moves to clear out some more money and they say like we'll bring you back for six million a year or something like that for two or three years, and he turns that down. I still say it's loser energy. Like I get, I get the idea of like wanting to go home. I get it, but like, Bundy, this comes back to the thing that I've always said, right? If if I'm supposed to believe that you're the captain of a team or you're a leader of a team, your your in- intrinsic motivation should be to win as many Stanley Cups as you can, or to compete on as many Stanley Cup winning teams as you can. If you're if you're content after one, and you still have two to three really productive years left in you, and you just go, no, nah, I'm gonna go home. I'm going to go to a team that, like, I might kind of help get into the playoffs. That ain't it, man. That's not for me. But whatever. That that, I, 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 that, players, that would bother me. Still plenty of players that live by the motto of fourth check, back check, paycheck. And uh, that's probably never going to change. Um, did, you ever have a, there, did, you ever, did you ever have a desire to go play at home? Never. Not for one second. Never. Yeah. <laughs> everybody's different well, honestly, right? God, I, I would have avoided this i know i just didn't know i did not want to i mean if you're talking i don't even want to compare if you're getting six million to play in florida and they offer you four in ottawa and you go play in ottawa that's dumb yeah loser mentality right um hear you. the the thing that i wanted to get to with you guys though is you know you mentioned two guys that have have been kind of polarizing especially for the fan base travis connect and ivan Provorov, and how they've played better especially as of late and I, I i would attribute part of that to the trade deadline passing both guys were mentioned in trade rumors right st louis once in or wanted in and probably will revisit this offseason a conversation around either travis sanheim or ivan Provorov, right like that that is decently well known but there's there's another element to this and it's interesting because if you listen to some people who might not otherwise normally be plugged in or know what's going on, but maybe getting fed some information, 
it, it was interesting to hear around the trade deadline about how the team has soured on Ivan Provorov, right? Like, we talked about it a bit, and we talked about it for a little bit here, that they might look to move on him uh, on from him just for the sake of trying to recoup the, as much value as you can. But when you start hearing people who otherwise don't report on things or hearing pe- from people who I would just say aren't plugged in, when they start saying, oh, no, this organization's really soured on Ivan Provorov, that means one thing. That means somebody's spreading a story behind the scenes, and they're trying to disseminate that information to as many different people as they can to try to almost like ready a fan base for the potential divorce of a player and a team. And so I'm very interested to see as this offseason approaches and as we get through the offseason, if those rumblings and those murmurs get louder. Because it's it was almost as if, leading up to the deadline, there was information being put out uh, almost like in a way to slander Provorov. I don't know how to feel about it. I don't know where the um, the total souring has come from. We'll, we'll see. I just think it's really interesting. And now that the deadline's passed, he seems to be not back to number one defenseman form, but he looks certainly better. I think it's actually kind of a nice thing for Cam York, right? Because we always talk about how Provorov needs a legitimate number one next to him to steady him, to get him to his highest level. I'm not saying Cam York is a number one defenseman, but he's done a decent enough job as a steady, you know, pairing partner that like, man, Cam York might actually be a decent NHL player. And if you can go into next year, you talk about the, the, um, the hell do I call it? The cascading effect, right? If next year you can go into Provorov and York as one of your pairings, whether that's your first pair or your second pair, and you've got Ryan Ellis who comes back, who's presumably your number one defenseman, you can start to tinker a little bit. You might not have to stack Provorov and Ellis on that top pair. Maybe it does allow Erasmus Ristolainen to move down to a third pair, or for you to bring somebody else in that puts Sanheim and and Ristolainen on your third pair. Like, I actually kind of like some of the possibilities that are here, and honestly, I'm fine seeing Cam York on either the top pair or the second pair, even going into next year if he earns it, because I like what that does to the rest of that defensive core. Bundy, like, is that a sound rationale? You're muted, but you're mu- you're muted, pal. Look at him. Sorry, my gut. My dogs were there barking there, and I was trying to. I was told them to shut up there, so I didn't want to yell too <laughs> much. Uh, you know what? It, um, that's a that's an interesting one, and and again, I I think when you say that, Russ, a lot of those are what ifs. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Ryan Ellis, I, again, you know, he's out this year. We got a penciled in for beginning of the year. I mean, there's no way that guy's going to be healthy the whole year, even if he comes in healthy. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been, I've been around long enough to know that I probably know too much when it comes to injuries and guys, physical levels as they get older. Um, you know, partnerships are, I, I could probably speak better than anybody about this, but partnerships are a chemistry, right? Like with like a Desjardins, I mean, Desjardins was an exceptional player. I didn't have the talent level Desjardins had. He's a good skater, but our chemistry was amazing together. So that to me, sometimes, you know, he may be developing that chemistry right now um, with Cam York, if it's Provorov. And, and I can't tell you sometimes how beneficial I could be. I look back at my career and I mean, I played with Desjardins for 10 years. I still had to find a way to stay there for that long. But when you got a partner like that and you feed off each other, you enjoy playing the game together. And I think that may be a little bit of where they're at. Um, you need to find some stability in that pair, especially a top pair. Um, but chemistry is the biggest part of it. You know, I mean, if people would look and say, how, gee, how could that pair have made sense? Like a guy like, or like Brad, uh, Brad McCrimmon and Mark Howe, right? Like what's well, a big guy and you got the elusive skater and, and maybe it wasn't so much different with me and me and Desjardins, but it, there's something that worked with that. And there was a chemistry that we were able to play 22, 23 minutes a night, shut teams down and get the puck out of the zone. So I'm willing to explore with those things, Russ. I am. Um, and I think next year, guys, I think there's going to be a lot of flexibility, Anthony, right, to be able to try these things. Because, listen, I'm not coming in again in the fall and everyone telling me this team's got a cup of aspirations. I knew it didn't. And I'm not going to have somebody bullshit me again and tell me that this team's going to be all that next year. I don't care who's back healthy. Until they prove that they can play cohesively without the guy that's been their leader for 12 years, uh, that remains to be seen. But it's an opportunity, as I say, to experiment next year uh, to try to find the pieces of that puzzle that you really want to keep moving into the future. And I think that, you know, it'll be another strange year. There probably won't be a ton of winning, but it'll be a really good time for evaluation, I think, in terms of how you're going to create and build that team into the future. I think that's fair. Um and there, there have been questions going around recently about why the Flyers aren't bringing up more of their AHL players 
down the stretch here. Mm -hmm. Uh, Can you give people an idea of why we aren't seeing like the Isaac Ratcliffe's of the world getting brought up and the, and the Wade Allison's, the Tanner Lysinski's like, why are they not all up here right now playing with this team, getting NHL reps, you know, in, in games that don't matter. So there's a rule in the NHL that post deadline, you're only allowed to recall three players from the AHL. Now you could do technically you could end up doing more than that. If there's an injury, you're allowed to recall somebody on emergency recall, like that they just did for uh, Felix Sandstrom was called up because Carter Hart had an injury and needed a backup right. goalie. So the Flyers are allowed to recall Sandstrom on an emergency recall, but as soon as Hart is ready to go, Sandstrom has to go back. He cannot stay. Okay. So the, so there are emergency recall possibilities, but you're only allowed to recall three players, and that's it. Um, usually teams don't like to burn those three recalls right away uh, because you have a whole month of a season. Is that, that one recall per player, Anthony, only? Or is no, that well, no, you can so that player can go up and down, but you're only okay. allowed it's only allowed to be three different players, right? Okay. So they can go up and down. All right. So here's the thing. So they had so you, you know, most teams don't want to use that last one. They they'll use two, but they don't want to use the third one just in case of an, uh, you know, things go haywire at the very end of the season. So here's where, where the Flyers are at. The Flyers on trade deadline day made a paper transaction and the paper transaction was they sent both cam york and max wilman back to the phantoms and then as soon as the deadline passed they recalled both of them okay so it was a it was they didn't go anywhere they were still on the plane with the team whatever but they sent them down and called them back up well why would you do that so the plan at the time was that the phantoms were within striking distance of the last playoff spot in the AHL. And the thought process was if we can make, you know, have some of these young guys playing together, even if it's at the AHL level um, and make a push for a playoff spot, get in and then play in some playoff games together. There's a, there's a positive element to that, right? There's a, there's a positive element to what it takes to, you know, take that, take that, take that stride or take those strides as a team together. So that's what the, the flyers thought was. So they were thinking, okay, we could send York and Woman down and they could be part of that. Well, the Phantoms immediately lost a few games in a row. Um, they went from being, you know, within striking distance to now probably not going to make it. I mean, I think they're nine points out. I mean, they still got a game. The, the Phantoms are they're yeah. in last place. I'm looking at it last yeah, place. Yeah, but, I think, but the, the, the playoff structure in, in the AHL is weird this year. They, they only have to – They I think it's like four, uh, six teams from their, their division – or five teams from their division and three teams from the other division. I forget how they're, it works. They're but... 10 points out of that spot and nine points from the bottom of the division. So the last place in division, nine points behind the yeah. seventh place team. So that's, so that's, that's the thing. So that's, they, they are nine points out now at this point. Um, so that, that puts them in a spot where they're probably not going to get in. So this is why York and Wilman are just going to stay here. But the fact is, is that because the flyers have used those two moves, they only have one player left that they can recall (laughs) for the rest of the month from the phantoms so you could look at that and say okay well which one of those guys are you going to recall or you know do you hold on to it because you don't know what's going to happen with injuries and the like etc etc so what they're doing instead instead of recalling guys like um, wade allison and tanner lashinsky or isaac radcliffe those guys are playing with the phantoms and they've all they've all been they've all got their nhl experience already um, and instead, they're going to play these college kids. So you're going to see they're playing Noah Cates, and they're going to play Ronnie Adder this Saturday. He's going to be in the lineup. Um, and then Nate Thompson's coming back in the line. Well, why the hell is Nate Thompson coming back? Well, there's no one else to put in there. You can't mm-hmm. put anybody else in that spot. And when Bobby Brink finishes with Denver, he's going to sign, and he's going to play in the NHL. So the, those younger players who are college kids are going to play in the NHL. But very likely, I mean, one of them might get a call up at the end, like the last week of the season, just because it's, all right, it's the end of the season. We can probably get them in for three or four games, but that's it. I mean, you're only going to get one of those guys to come back up. Uh, and said they're playing, they're playing AHL games instead. Going to come down to a coin toss. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I mean, pretty much. so it is. So, and like, here's where I struggle. Try to explain this to me. Explain this to me like I'm an idiot, which I might be. If the if the Flyers complete, like, say two of the trades like say they they trade Derek Broussard the day before the deadline right instead of deadline day they trade him the day before they clear that spot and they like bring up Isaac Ratcliffe then like in that moment he would not have counted as one of those three like they they could have theoretically like he would have been okay to be on the roster correct and to go back and forth uh no because once you once 
so he would have been on the roster, but mm-hmm. then it depends on if they would have decided if they were going to make him eligible to go back to the AHL. And so then Got if it. they were, okay. if they were going to wave him back down, they would have had to do the same thing like they did with York and, and, and Millman, uh, uh, Willman, not Millman. That's the, that's the other okay. process. They have a Millman not in the, the system and a Willman in the system. So Willman. Yeah. Um, so yes, no, they would have had to. So like, I know what you're trying to say, like, well, they could have called these guys up beforehand and then they would have all been on the roster. It would have been okay. Um, you know, the, it only would have worked in the in yeah. in the scenario where the Flyers say making the playoffs for the Phantoms is is practically not going to happen. Let's just bring as many of our young guys up as we can. If if the Flyers were to LTIR a guy, like say they shut down um, Kevin Hayes for the season, they put him on LTIR for the rest of the year. They yeah. could use an emergency call up then, right? Like they yeah. they could theoretically bring up a, a rat. You have now to use the first, you, but the thing is, is you have to use the first the remaining call up first. Okay. In, in that case, right? So they okay, would so have to, you. You yeah. could get an Allison and a and a Lachinsky up, or you can get an Allison and a um, a Ratcliffe up if you used one of the spots and then LTIR to guy. Like you theoretically could. Technically, you could. Yes. Okay. He's the guy I, mean, I that... want to see more of. Is Rat, Ratcliffe? He's the one I feel is really getting hosed by all of this more than yeah. anybody. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what the interesting thing is is like, like I don't understand he didn't look why bad when he was up. Why does the league have this rule? Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I, I, me, I don't understand. To me, it's it. a bad it's... rule. I mean, they're all making about the same, right, Anthony? Like you you can have you if you're allowed to expand your roster beyond 23, 23 players after the trade deadline, which the NHL, you're allowed to do as long as you could fit it under the cap. Why can't you call up more guys? Like what the hell? That's what I mean. Yeah, that's it's really dumb. And plus, you you know, you're going to tick guys off, too. Like you take. Believe me. When that one guy gets called up and like a couple don't in the minors, it is unbelievable. I'm sure we all good, like you want to see guys turn into a bunch of like little yeah. like 12 year old girls really quick. Go watch the guy that gets called up and the two guys that thought they were in line don't. Oh, it's no, a 12 year old boys <laughs> suck too. Yeah. Huh? Right. Like I said, 12 year old boys suck too. So yeah. every. I'm not saying all 12 year olds suck, but a lot of them suck. It's not just the girls, yeah, not just the boys. Girls they're, and lots they're... of them rush running around. And... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but so, um, I mean, yeah, I, I just don't think that the rule is good in the league. I think that they need to, yeah, you know, I, I, I don't know, I don't know who's who would take it. And like, how could you? I'm trying to figure out how a team could potentially like take advantage of that. I, I don't know. I mean, it's, you still have to stay within under the cap. It's not like yeah. you can. It's not like you can just constantly exceed the salary cap. I mean. So you're right. still managing within that cap, but if you can fit another player or two players or whatever, what the hell's the difference? Yeah, I agree, hundred percent. Good you point. Right? That's stupid. Good point. Stupid indeed. But hey. all right. Hey, anything uh, else you guys wanted to get to? What? Yeah, chemo. Oh yeah, oh. chemo teaminen. Chemo well, teaminen like has. First of all, thank chemo. Yeah, uh, we wanted to have him on. And I love, by the way, just so I know, I love Timo Team and one of the best guys I've ever co- covered when I played as a broadcaster. Tremendous human being. We are friends. He's a great guy. Um, but I'd like to thank him for kind of <laughs> pretty much saying what we said all year long. Just a little late to the party. That's all. So, Chemo has a podcast. Did we know this? No one knew this. I He's did got not. a podcast in Finland. It's in Finland and it's in mm-hmm. Finnish. Um, sorry, and, I didn't finish it yet. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I'll finish it later. Yeah. <laughs> and and Kimo had some comments, and I, I you know, I'm just I just want to read a couple of the comments here. Um, and, and it's again, it's it's not anything that's kind of new, but it's it's interesting to hear it from somebody that's not Bundy. Um, mm-hmm. so you know, first thing he says is, um, you know, this was now this was right before the deadline. He's like, um. Uh, uh, he says, now that we're no longer in playoff contention. Oh, so that, so here's what I got. I got to start before that. Um, he says, you know, uh, I'll give my opinion on how things should go with the flyers organization. They have 19 games left. And if someone didn't see the tweet, I just said, it's time to let the young guys play. What I mean by that is there's cam York, for example, this young defenseman. And a couple of games ago, Keith Yandel was playing on the power play before him. What sense does it make? Now that we're no longer in playoff contention, right? No sense. So let these young go- young players play the 19 games remaining. And I'm not only talking about Cam York. They have others. Forwards, they should put them in different roles. Like put Cam York on the penalty kill or match him against elite players so you get some idea of what Cam York can do. And at the same time, the players can see where they are at the NHL level. 
and where they need to develop. The Flyers should use these 19 games as evaluation to see what they are doing as an organization, what kind of players they have picked, and how those players are doing at the NHL level because it's a fact that there's work to do and a lot of it. So that's, that, was the, that was the main crux of what Kimo said. I mean, there was some more stuff as well um, uh, talking about, you know, the construction of this team. He, he basically, you know, agreed. Wait, let's get, but let's we'll get to it. Let's, let's, let's get there. For, like, it, it, it's <laughs> nice might... to hear. It's nice to hear that we're not crazy. And also it's nice to hear that somebody who had a successful NHL career is effectively saying, the hell with Keith Yandel. He got his Iron Man streak. You owe him nothing. This is dumb. Good job. Okay, but here's and, and and I know, buddy, you're going to say the same thing, right? You would agree with Russ, right? And you've been saying this: why is Yandel playing, kind of thing, right? Well, the whole, they, whole. My my issue is not Keith Yandel. It's never about Keith Yandel. All right. First right. of all, I'm sure he's an unbelievably great guy. He's been a good teammate to play that many games. You had to do something right. My problem with the whole Keith Yandel signing was not the fact that he was going on the Iron Man. That was the case. I think it was wonderful. Go sign with Buffalo or somebody. But when you committed to Keith Yandel, you had to put him in the lineup for the first 50 games. He couldn't play in the playoffs last year in Florida, right? The whole league knew it. So you sign a guy to come in here to, to be a bulk part of your team. That's irresponsible. That's irresponsible signing and work. You can't put a guy in that you're not sure is going to buy into the defense or ra- rightly so can even play at a competitive level in his own zone. His numbers of plus minus would suggest he can't, and he hasn't all year. Nothing to do with the person at all. But that part by Chuck bringing a guy in and signing him on day one, you knew, and that coach knew, that as bad or as shitty a night as he might have had, he's still in the lineup the next night because he's got the streak going. It's garbage. You go do that in Arizona at their 4,000-seat stadium or whatever it is. You don't do that here. So, and, and that's fair. And, and it's fair. And I think that you guys both make fair points. And here's what I'm going to – Don't I'm gonna res- you effing dare. Here's how I'm going to respond to it. I'm going to give you a slightly opposite take. And that's okay. I, and I don't think that you guys are way off. Because, I, you know, in, what Bundy is saying is, is, is true. Mm-hmm. The, the thing of it is is that when they signed Keith Yandel, and they signed him, what, a month – not even a month before the season opens, a little bit less than that, and brought him in. Um, and brought him in at the veteran minimum. That's all they could afford, right? Yeah. So they didn't think, they didn't believe that Cam York was ready, and they believed that they were going to contend. So they wanted to bring in a veteran defenseman. Now, you could argue that Yandel's not the right one, and that's a fair argument, but they wanted to bring in a veteran defenseman to be in that role until they felt Cam York was ready, which they kind of thought was going to be around mid-January, okay? This was pre covid you know, that, you know, that got pushed a little bit because of the COVID games, whatever. But they kind of thought mid-January was the time that, yeah, that, um, that York would be ready to go. So it was like, all right, we need somebody who can fill in that role for 40, 45 games. And they chose Keith Gandel. And they, you look at it and say, okay, well, you know, we know he's going to, you know, he's probably not going to get hurt. He's going to play. He's got this little streak thing going. We'll get him to that point. We'll get him there. And then we have a kid ready to come in who we think can take over and play in that role uh, as we you know, push for towards the playoffs. Well, then the season goes to shit and everything goes sideways. Right. And, you know, it, yeah, Yandel sets the record. Okay, great. All's well and good. And so it's like, okay, well then why is Keith Yandel still playing? You got the record. Why is he still in the lineup? Well, this kind of reverts back to what we just talked about, about not having the ability to call up anybody else to come in and play. And even if they did, and I guess the only one really that's in the minors that you look at and say maybe is Zamula, but I don't. He, there's a lot he's of physically people, not ready. He, there's a lot of people tell you he's just not not ready for the NHL. But let's just say he were. If he were the one that was going to come up, why is Keith Yandel the guy he's replacing in the lineup as opposed to Nick Sealer or Connaughton? Because those guys are playing too. Mm-hmm. And so if you're if you're if you're a, if you're a bad team at this point, you're in last place or you know, towards last place overall in the conference, like your last place in the division. Um, and you're not going anywhere. These games don't matter. And you don't have a young prospect to come up and replace him. What the hell's the difference? Why are we screaming that? that yeah. Now you can talk about, I think chemo has got a good point to say, why is Yandel playing the power play instead of York? They eventually made that switch. Uh, finally. I mean, that was one that they could have, they could have done sooner. I agree on that front, 
But as far as pulling Yandel out of the lineup at this point, like what, what the hell's the difference? He's not blocking anyone. My, 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 and I agree with you. I'm fine. I'm fine with it. My problem yeah. is never with him playing now when the yeah. games are meaningless. My problem is the fact that he should have been playing 45 games the whole year. Right. That's the problem. When you brought him in, you, you made a commitment to him that you were going to play however many games it was to get to the stretch. And by the way, after he set the record, which you knew he was going to do, he's going to keep going anyway. Right. Yep. You know, you're going to keep playing him anyway, because then all of a sudden it looked like here, this dude, I'm telling you that the, the, the Yandel signing to me, I know that the number was the only thing that made sense. This is a, it's a nightmare scenario. So if he breaks a record, right. And you pull him out the next night, you're saying to him, we only played you because you wanted you to set the record. You really weren't any good. And we're trying to tell you that now. The other thing we're going to, they're telling you is that to get to that record, it's going to be eclipsed by, by the guy in Arizona, a Kessel within a few days anyway. Right. Play him for the, to get the record and then sit him when it's going to get broken by Kessel within a month anyhow. Yeah, I so mean, this was a double, triple-edged, lose, well, lose, lose, sore. Well, I mean, and the only, the only other, the only thing I can say, and you're right about that, Bunny. And the only thing I could say back to that, and this is the only thing I could say back to that, is as you know, you don't make it through a season with just six defensemen. You need seven, eight, nine, right? So, you know, he sets, you know, he's a guy, and you, all right, let's get you know, get you to the record, and then we'll reevaluate where we're at come January. As it turned out, they needed to keep him in the lineup because. Ellis didn't play, right? And then, and you know, then they had other times where you know other guys were out of the lineup. Whatever, you know, Provorov had to miss games for COVID, and um, right. Ristolainen right. missed a couple games. Yeah, and, I get all, I get so, all that. So, so in, in that regard, that. in that regard, you're right. I mean, he had to, you know, he wouldn't have, he shouldn't have played all those games. He, you, you're right. It should have been a 40, 40 game, forty five game thing, like a seven number seven defenseman should be. Um, I just think that everybody kind of got caught up in the fact that that this was more about the streak than it was about developing players. But I'm not certain other than maybe here in the last, you know, 15, 20 games, getting York a little bit more time in in certain situations that other than that, I'm not certain that there was ever a point where, you know, it really mattered whether Keith Gandel was in the lineup or not. There's only one, there's only one good reason, honestly, if we're being realistic about it, the only reason, and I'm, I, this signing happened after Kevin Hayes' brother passed, correct? I think it was just before. It was just before. I think okay, it was right it, before. It negates. It. it negates what I was going to say. I was going to say if because yeah. I don't remember if if that had yeah. happened, and then you said this is another support system for Kevin Hayes in like a, a horrific moment in his life. I, I would say like that's that's fine. Like it has nothing to do with hockey. It has more to do with the human being, and and that's fine. I think that yeah. this kind of comes back to where I get frustrated with. Like there, there's a there's a quasi delusional way to look at this if you're a front office, right? Like, if if by all accounts Keith Yandel needed to be sheltered in the in the best way possible for him to even be a remotely serviceable player at the end of last year with a much more talented Florida team, if you look at that as an NHL GM and say, yeah, you know what, we're not that far off, or like, well one of the better teams had to shelter him, but we can give him more playing time and he's going to do better in our system. There's an arrogance on the coach and on the GM for that. Like that, that to me is a bad evaluation. That's a misevaluation of talent. And the other thing is the reason that you needed to go after a guy on the minimum is because you kind of mismanaged your cap. And that's, that will continue to be a thing. I think with this GM and this regime is I'm, I will continue to be concerned about the lack of cap flexibility. That's why we're talking about, or even leading up to the deadline, we were talking about guys like Konechny and Provorov or even a Sanheim potentially needing to be moved. Not because they're bad players, but because you need to try to free up some cap at some, at some point because you don't have flexibility. And you have a few really bad contracts on your cap right now that you're probably not going to be able to move, either because of no movement clauses or because the guys just aren't very good. And so... You know, if you manage the cap a little bit better, if you have, say, a million and a half left or two and a half million left at the end of the offseason and there's somebody else out there that you can sign, I, I don't know, or you get involved and you, you solidify the, the bottom pair a little bit earlier, you make it a little bit more of a priority to get that position filled prior to the start of the season, that's probably a better outcome. I don't think they ever should have been in position to go out and sign Keith Yandel in the first place, if that makes sense, right? Like, they... Yeah. Yeah, it just shouldn't I, and, have been. and that's where that's where I'm at. And again, I don't know the personal thing, Russ, with with Kevin. I I, I didn't consider. I know they're great friends. He considers him a yeah. brother, um, and and that means something to me. What in the field of life I'm in now, that definitely means something. That support and stuff. But so 
Uh, I didn't want to jump ahead of that, but I just mean as a player, you know, from a standpoint of putting him in, if that was the case, my issue is not about now at all with Keith. And I, and I know he's a great guy. I mean, you can't play that long in the league and not many consecutive games without pissing someone off. And, mm-hmm. uh, and he hasn't, he's been in the line every game and I commend him for that. A huge, huge salute to him. Um, it's just the fact that I think when you bring a guy in and you're telling everyone, this is a team that's going to do something really special this year. Um, and you committed to a guy that couldn't play in the playoffs last year because the coach didn't want him in the lineup. Um, that's, that's my issue was the beginning part, not the part that we're in now. It's the pea soup is the pea soup now. Uh, there's enough hands in that, but I'm just saying at the, at the beginning, that's where the changes have to come for me beginning of the year. We know there's the, it's an opportunity, I think, for whoever's calling the shots here to really, you know, put something on the ice. It's going to be competitive, but you're also going to be able to find out a lot of answers. Next year's an answer searching season in a lot of ways. Yeah, and I that, I this, think, for this group. I think that's part of the problem, too. And that's why I'll come back to, and I, it probably won't happen, but that's why I want to see change. And, yeah. and I don't think that this front office regime should have another offseason. You know, whether whether you're in Ant's camp where you look at what Minnesota has now and you say, hey, they developed those players well. You know, Chuck Fletcher and Brent Flair did a great job of drafting those guys. Kaprasov was in, what, the fifth round? Like, that's great, and that's awesome, and it's not always going to happen. And maybe some of the picks that they've made are going to eventually grow and develop. There, there's not a lot right now that tells me that the development process with the Flyers organization is exactly elite, right? If it were, you wouldn't be in the position you're currently in. So um, I look at it and I say... I've seen enough misevaluating of, of talent, of the cap. I, I think that you go into next year with a brand new outlook. I think you need front office overhaul. You're obviously going to have a new head coach in here. And I'm going to make a very bold statement. I'm going to make a very bold prediction. You know, we're not that far removed from people believing that the reason that Ron Hextall lost his job is because he wouldn't get rid of Dave Hextall. I'm in a position right now where I sit back and I look at what Dave Scott is and what Dave Scott has put out to the public. He very clearly is of the belief that whatever Chuck Fletcher has done on the hockey op side is good. He, he publicly stated that he believes that the organization's heading in the right way and they're, they're doing a great job by hiring more analytics folks and that they're you know, continuing to, to, to flesh out you know, other areas of the front office. And he thinks it's great. The losing sucks and he's unhappy with losing, but he's happy with the organizational structure. If Dave Scott isn't willing to do that job, move on from Chuck Fletcher, which I think he needs to. Brian Roberts at some point is going to have to step in. And I'm not totally convinced that Brian Roberts would make a move. And I'm not saying that Brian Roberts will remove Dave Scott. And I'm not saying that Brian Roberts is going to want to see Chuck Fletcher gone. But I don't think they're going to totally clean house. I will say this now, and I know that every executive is flawed. Nobody is perfect. You will find any executive ones that people love and people hate. You will find pros and you will find cons. I would rather see going into next year, Val Camillo get promoted to Dave Scott's job. If it means I get a new front office for the Philadelphia Flyers, I would. And it might go well and it might go horribly. But Dave Scott to me is a, is a nothing burger. He doesn't change things. I want a new front office. I'm willing for a promote. I will publicly campaign Val Camilla to take over for Dave Scott if she brings me a good hockey executive to turn this team around. It's already here and you don't know it yet, Ed. <laughs> that was a beautiful diatribe right there. I appreciate that. You know what, you know what I appreciate the most about that, Russ? It's going to get me a phone call. Um, <laughs> thanks. Tell him to call, tell him to call me. <laughs> Um, they anyway. could also call me. I'm the one who said it. No, I agree. I agree. They could. They could. Yeah, it's not difficult. Yeah. Aren't you supposed to like shock me this week, Russ? What do you have for me? Yeah, I don't well, know. That I don't, a, that, that, yeah, I don't know. That wasn't you said, out. Bundy, I got something for you there before. And, uh, well, that was it. That was it. I mean, he's, that know, was he, it. Oh, I thought you were going to be surprised. I really did. Right. But I think this is wow. Look at this. Appreciate that, kid. That's well thought out. <laughs> um. Look, Russ. Anything is po- Russ. Anything is possible. It is anything is possible. Yeah. Like we don't know, we don't know what you know. Um, we do know we don't have the exact numbers yet. Um, but Bundy, I know that you you put something out, and I've already heard it as well. And I'm trying to get the uh, actual figures. And once I do, we'll we'll do something on crossing. I heard blood, from but, somebody in the inside that they said yeah. it was worst season ticket renewal in the history of their franchise. Yeah, it's and it's quite possible. That's quite possible. That's the case. Um, so uh, now keep in mind, this was the first round of renewals. 
So this was the automatic, you know, when, you know, this, these are your diehards, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, I talked to someone who said, well, if the diehards aren't renewing, what does that tell you? That's um, not- you know, that's because don't you have to go out of your way to stop yourself from renewing Like if you're one of these people on like the, the you, initial have to, stage, uh, you actually have to opt out. You have to go in, to, and which it, is a and really, from, that's, from a, I understand, that's a very bad sign. From what I understand, the process to do it was not exactly the easiest thing in the world either. Uh, it's all like lot. unsubscribing from an email, right, Anthony? Yeah, it was it's right, like it's unsubscribing right. from bespoke posts where you have to yeah, send them was, an email and like give them the blood of your firstborn child. Yeah, it wasn't exactly easy. Unsubscribe like, you. Because a lot of people were like, you, you weren't, apparently you weren't supposed to sign into your account when you went to the page and a lot of people were, and then they couldn't find it. And it was like in small print. Like it was, it was, a, it was a really complex thing. But anyway, um, even with that, they still had uh, the, the lowest renewal. And, you know, I will say this. I mean, you can, we can, we can knock the business side all we want. We do all the time on this site. I I mean, on this show. Um, But in reality, I mean, if the team is as bad as the team is, there's really not a lot that anybody, I mean, you could bring in the greatest business minds in in the world. If they're dealing with a last place team that doesn't look like it has a future, it's going to be really hard to convince people to buy season tickets. Right. I mean, you, you, it's, that's a tough sell. It's a, it's a tough sell regardless. So, uh, you know, a lot of this has to go on to the, the team needs to get better, but yes, it, it's, it's something. And I think that they rec- I think that they realize it like, Holy shit. I think that this is part of the problem. And it, because of that, Russ, maybe your thing that you just went on a diatribe about, maybe it's not that far off. Maybe Comcast looks at this and says, what the hell's going on? Like maybe the, yeah. the shareholders, Maybe it's not even Brian Roberts. Maybe it's the shareholders in Comcast who are looking at it and saying, what the hell's going on with the Flyers? Like, why are we not making, why are we losing all this money? Yeah. You I know? think it's Tucker Roberts is really the one that gets, I think it's probably the one that has to get more involved. I think a little bit more, but yeah, there has to be some accountability guys. And, and again, I think the crowds have been going down over the years anyway, I, whether I don't mm-hmm. know the pandemic didn't help, but even before the pandemic, there was a lot of buildings was starting to go lower and lower. It had yeah, yeah. nothing to do with a bad hockey team. So, you know, again, uh, you know, at that time, we didn't know that this team would exist back then. And it was starting to go down. And I, you know, I went on, I said, you know, what do you, how do you repair a team? that's going like on like that. My social media posts, what do you, you get a Mrs. Gritty or a sister or something like that. That's what I don't want. Right. Like I don't want more of that. I want more stuff geared back towards what this franchise was and what me people really want to go back to it. And, and I think a lot of it was a brotherhood, a, uh, People felt like it was them against the world. That's what Philly sports is in a lot of ways. It's not about the things that the, the Flyers have, I think, self-destructed with uh, the business side. I think there's a way to push that forward in another way, but they've yet to do it. And that's what I don't want. I don't want more gritty because as a team is improving. Yeah, I, I, will, you- I, will, I will say this. I don't know if you've noticed this. Again, I, I can only point out for home games. I mean, I don't really notice the difference on TV, um, but at the home games, you know, gritty does his thing at the beginning, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But then we don't really see him a lot after that. Like, you know, okay. you know, a little bit here, a little bit there. They've really toned him down this year since things got bad in in building, in the building. I mean, there's still, there's still a shit ton of promotions that have gritty tied to it, right, whatever. But in the arena, I don't think we get to – I don't think we're seeing as much gritty as we used to see. I mean, remember you used to have the two guys who were like the – the, yeah, um, the security guards service, for him. security guards mm-hmm. like enough none of that stuff like we're not seeing we're not seeing any of that stuff so maybe they're they're recognizing that that's a that's a bad thing to try and push when the team is bad so i don't know i don't, I don't know is that a, is that a sign of maybe looking at it a different way i don't know well i know we'll, it's hard to yeah, make a find out. it's hard to make a direct correlation here but do you guys think that if if they had decided earlier in the year, like when they got rid of Elaine Vigneault, if they had also fired Fletcher in that moment, right? And, the, and Dave Scott had come out publicly and said, look, here's where we're at. This didn't work. Very clearly didn't work. We're going to do some patchwork through the rest of the season. It's clear we're not going to contend for a Stanley Cup. We are going to get it right. We're going to take the next X number of months to find the best executives, the best potential executives that are coming up through the ranks of other organizations, the best coaches, the best young coaches at the AHL level and from around the world. We're going to take the next six months to evaluate this and come back ready for next year. Do you think that correlates to fewer season ticket holders bailing? Because I do. I feel like that it is difficult. There's not a way to really test this, right? It's all it's all game theory. But to me... If I'm a season ticket holder and I see that and, and you're open with me about that, I say, you know, yeah, I'll, I'll roll the dice again next year. But given the way that things are right now, 
you're it, it almost feels like you're going back into another year of the same, even though you just moved your captain. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, it doesn't make a lot of sense, Russ. And, and I think that that's, you know, I think that they they tried to start that way when, you know, having Scott at the press conference and having him say directly to fans that, you know, this is unacceptable. You know, I apologize to you, like all that stuff. Right. That was the that's the first step. But we kept saying, hey, that's a good first step, but it needs to be more. Right. So I, what you're suggesting would have been more, but I'm not certain that they were ready to take such a leap forward mm -hmm. at that time. But it could happen. I think that's what I think what you're saying makes sense. I think now that you say, OK, renewals are so bad, maybe that next leap needs to happen now. And maybe we need to have that big change coming up here. It could I mean, that when does that next wave of renewals happen, by the way? You said that this was the first wave. When's the second wave? Well, I mean, there's always it's it's not, it's kind of a tie. It's not even that. It's it's more like it's just like a running. You have a deadline to renew. Yeah, right? you have a deadline. And then there's partials, which, you know, and then okay. you, have, you have partial plans and season ticket equivalencies and like all those things kind of it's really complicated stuff. But the, the first deadline, which was you know, a week and a half ago, um, that is for you, like your diehards who early birds who sign up every year to get all the perks and discounts and everything else. That's those people. Um, and that was their lowest that they've, they've, that they've had, at least in recent memory is what I was told. Bundy heard it could be all, all time. And it very well could be, you know, I don't have the numbers going back that far. Um, I trust but, my source pretty good, but again, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. yeah it, no, 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 it, I, I trust it. It's, it's bad. It's, it's, it's bad. bad. Regardless, it's bad. Regardless, it's bad. Whether, yeah. whether it's not, the, I mean, maybe they had a, a, a bad year it. in 1972. Who the hell gives, right, you know, right, who cares, right, right, right? You know, I mean, right. it's, it's bad, right? Um, so, but I, that's what I'm saying to you, Russ. Like, what, you're what you just suggested may not be ridiculous. It may not be, it, like, it could be the next big step. The VC the era? The VC era. Could be. You know, I guess what we're trying to say here is if you're trying to hashtag save Dave, you hash you have to hashtag Chuck Chuck. Huh? See that? See that? Oh. Anyway, we gotta we got <laughs> Chuck. How long do you think it right. took him to think okay. of that, Bundy? I, I just came up with it. I'm really proud of myself. Waiting all day for that was a surprise the people, you were telling me about. <laughs> the people who are watching this on the Crossing Broad YouTube channel when it comes out, you'll see that for the last forty five seconds I was formulating it, I was trying to figure out how to wedge that in. Anyway, look, we we've been at this for long enough. Yeah. Uh it, it was good to get back in the saddle. I I actually feel a little bit more positive about the team now that we've gotten past the deadline, now that we're starting to see some of the guys that had been rumored uh, to be in potential discussions kind of coming back to life. We're, we now get to see these college kids. There's an actual reason to watch a bad losing Flyers team, right? We actually have a reason to watch these last few weeks. So uh, yeah. we'll be here every week. Uh, irregular days. We got an announcement what? next week, don't we, Bundy? I do. I, next week will be a big announcement. I have to make actually, guys, something uh, completely off the cuff that kind of fell into my lap in the last two or three weeks. I'm excited about it. Really, a flair for the history of the sport, and actually for the present sport, a little bit of hockey. So I'm looking forward to making that announcement next week, whenever we do it. Yeah, great show again this week, guys, and I look forward to it. Uh, by the way, you know, we're, we're heading out here. Don't forget, you can always go into the episode description to find all of the links and the, the things I'm about to, to hit here. But you can find the podcast wherever you get your podcasts, right? You got Apple Podcasts, Amazon, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, pretty much any podcast app that you have. Look for Snow the Goal. You'll find it. You should subscribe. We, we love and appreciate it. Leave us a five-star review. That's really big. You can leave a five-star review over on Apple Podcasts. And, of course, you can also leave a five-star rating on uh, Spotify. You pull up the show in the Spotify app, you click the star rating underneath, leave five stars. We greatly appreciate it. You can find Ant on Twitter at Ant San Philly. You can find Bundy on Twitter at Cetarian6. You can follow me at Joy on Broad. The show is on Twitter and Instagram at Snow the Goalie. Uh, and also on Facebook.com slash Snow the Goalie. One other thing before we leave here, we set this up. Uh, we have a now a Snow the Goalie community on Twitter. I don't really know what the community function is supposed to be. It looks like we can just kind of tweet to a small group, and if you're in that group, you can tweet specifically at those people, not out into the public of Twitter. So I think we're kind of treating it sort of like a Facebook thing, right? Like kind of being able to go back and forth with people who are not necessarily of a like mind. We are totally all about people going in there and disagreeing about the direction of the hockey team. You know, just a really simple thing. Don't be a dick. I think it's pretty much it. You know, yeah. express yourself, yeah. put your thoughts out there. You don't have to be a dick about it. And it'll be fine. 
I'm looking forward to that. I think we're going to do some more stuff with that as well. So you can search on Twitter communities for Snow the Goalie, and we'll let you in. I think we're going to try to do some engagement stuff there. We'll try to start taking some questions and specific things from that little group um, in addition to Twitter DMs and, and messages on Facebook and everything as we come up with uh, the next few weeks of shows. So for Ant at Ant San Philly, for Bundy at Cetarian6, I'm Russ at Julian Broad. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you again next week here on the Only Flyers podcast, Snow the Goalie.